Hello. Welcome back to another Pen Talk. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for following me as I explore this incredible wide world of pens that I find around us. So here is a pen that I found on eBay that attracted my attention for a number of reasons. The first one was its price. Here's the auction that I won. The second thing is it was uh, sold by a local, I would call antiques dealer in New Jersey, a couple hours away from me. And it's a nice big, what looks to be a Schaefer balance based on the cap, but the fact that this barrel has a flat end on it makes it somewhat unique. The only downside to it is the fact that the nib seems to have a little bit of uh, distortion there at the end, but we'll see if that interferes with writing. This popped out easily, which I expected based on the auction. So when I look at an auction, I like looking at photos, and here's a series of photos of the pen. And you can see a little bit of that uh, distortion in the nib in the photos, so there was no hiding of anything. And one of the photos showed that the section was removed, and to me that's the only challenge to restoring one of these pens, which are a lever fill, and it is engraved. And it does have that, you know, Schaefer markings on it. There's, there's the Schaefer markings. There's the engraving, the markings, and there's the lever filler with the pin through it. But that flat end. And if we look at the cap, we'll notice it's that full ball on the end with a hump shape. So this is the early model of the cap. White dot lifetime, so that's good. All the parts fit together well. There's no abnormal wear or tear. And the auction was very clear. It needs a sack, but that to me is the easy thing to do. So I'm going to clean up this pen a little bit. It doesn't require a lot. Put a sack on it. Compare it to other pens. And we'll see how this nib writes. Again, I think this is a great buy. Definitely a unique pen. We'll explore a little bit of the history of the balance and see how this might fit in. I did find one photo, which we'll look at now. So I do like collecting books on pens. So when I saw this book at a pen show, it was sold by Pendemonium, a great group of people to get to know at a pen show when those eventually start happening again. On this page we see what looks to be a white dot Schaefer balance with a conical cap you'd expect on a balance, but the barrel is a flat end to it. And this apparently was salvaged from the USS Oklahoma at the bottom of Pearl Harbor. So this is the only example I found of a Schaefer balance top with a flat top bottom. So evidently they were made, but no one else seemed to have recorded them. And they're here just as a footnote to a photograph of a piece of history. Here's some uh, Schaefer pens I put together to show the transitions of the styles. The flat top was around for many, many years, started out 1910s, came in a number of different styles, but you notice it has that nice full ball clip on it. Here we have what I'm calling the transition pen with the flat top, but it has the ball clip, but just now has a hump in it where these are straight. Here we have what was a typical Schaefer balance, which is probably in the same size family is the black one and you notice how it has the pointy end top and bottom and it has a ball clip and it has a hump to it. So these have the both of them have the same clip on it same wide band here then as the pen evolved they flattened out the ball and they flattened out the clip and just here's two versions of it in black just to show that and if I look at any type of history of, of the Schaefer Pen Company I notice uh, an abrupt transition, 1928-1929. And they started moving away from hard rubber to cellulite and uh, pyrroline, which is a cellulite that they uh, trademarked from DuPont. 
So this is an interesting group of pens covering a history of about 35 years, maybe from maybe 1910. Now it's 25 years, so 1910 to 1935. So here are the pens posted, and the balances actually post very, very well, deeply, securely. This uh, transition pen doesn't post as well, but it posts similar to the square top pens. I mean, it's secure, but it adds a lot of length to the pen, and certainly one can see how that tapered barrel definitely facilitates posting and makes the pen balanced both unposted and posted. They all have fairly small sections, at least they're short. Some of them are pretty good girth. And they all have a really, really nice 14 karat gold nib. Let's focus in on that nib. So I think one thing Schaefer's can be known for is pretty good size gold nibs. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending upon your preferences, these are all stiff nibs. They're very smooth writers, very consistent writers, great everyday carry pens, but you're not going to get line variation out of these. And there is one two-tone here. Some, uh, all these are basically lifetimes, except for this uh, early one here. I think in order to understand this chronology, we need to take a look at the stampings on the barrels and look at patent dates. We'll do that next. Here we have the pens lined up. This one here is the, kind of the oldest one of these style of pens that I have. And you can see those patent dates on it. And it's the same patent dates that are on this transition balance. And here we have the green one. It's harder to read, but it is also the same patent dates. Then when we go to this older balance, I mean one of the earlier balances, you'll just see it says patented. And then we go to a, a newer balance. It has that uh, ink window here. There's no patent information at all. There's a little bit of a blemish there across it. So basically this barrel does fit into the flat top era of Schaefer pens. So after more studies, I've concluded beyond the shadow of a doubt that this pen is a Franken pen. A Franken balance, if you would like to refer to it as that, and I will. And why do I say that? Well, the giveaway is the clip that's on this pen. The ivory and black pen has the original style of clip that was first introduced in 1929 when the balance was first sold by Schaefer it was patented in 1928. Here's a drawing from the patent. And the difference is the length of the clip and the positioning of the clip versus the cap band. This was in use for two years until 1931. And then they raised the clip up a little bit and there's a gap here between the end of that clip and the cap band. And here there is no gap. It's almost right there. So if this was an old style clip, that would kind of lend itself to say this could be a transition pen, but no, it's not. But that's fine. Those of you that have watch some of my earlier videos. I, I enjoy doing Franken vintage pens because to me it's it's enjoying how a pen writes and it's fun how you can put parts together and make a pen that was never actually sold but may look good and certainly if I put it together will write well. So we now have a Franken balance that I purchased on eBay. So the next question is, are caps interchangeable? And the simple answer is yes. This is the cap from the transition pen, and it fits on this ivory balance. And here's a cap from the black pen, another black balance pen that fits on this flat top 
jade pen barrel. I've noticed a lot of uh, similarities in threading. A lot of the Waterman barrels will fit from one model to another because the threading was the same. It appears that Schaefer followed the same category, so it's not surprising to see a cap from one fit on the body of another, the barrel of another. Why did I refer to the Franken pen as the transition balance? Because I was referring to the Esterbrook J series, which also has an, a transition model, which preceded the final version, which had two jewels on either end. This had a flat end with no jewel, but a jewel at the top. And that, to me, corresponded to the balance where you have the newer version in the 30s that had a point on each end, and then a transition version with a point at the cap, but a flat bottom. As we discussed, uh, my further review has said that this is a Franken pen, and this is an older barrel fitted to a newer balance cap. But there were a lot of similarities. You know, here that Schaefer is in the clip. Here the Esterbrook is in the clip, but that's on the later version. The newer version, did, uh, the older version, did not have Esterbrook on the clip. There's also a, a trademark. Esterbrook in the barrel on the newer one, not in the older transition model. So that's why I use the word transition. I flush all my pens, especially I used vintage pen like this, and this was after a couple hours, and the first flush wasn't bad, but as I let it soak longer, more ink started to dissolve and come out. The flow is really good, which I like and appreciate. It's kind of what you would expect in a vintage pen. So I'm just going to let it soak a little bit longer. This is just uh, water with a little bit of detergent in it to break up the ink. So like I say, that's going to set for another hour or two before we continue on with putting in a bladder and finishing the restoration. I've uh, put a new bladder on it. The pen did not have a bladder when it was sent to me and that was very clear in the auction. So this is a number 20 bladder which fits well inside of this barrel. I would consider it an oversized. Uh, the largest uh, sack I have is a 22 so this is next to the largest and the 22 is just a little bit too snug. It's always good to have a little bit of a gap between the pressure bar and the sack and also have the sack have a a nice air gap around it to uh, keep it from any temperature changes but the barrel's pretty thick so I think this pen at least from historical my experience uh, will write very well so what I do is I cleaned off that end of the section where the sack is attached I do a little sanding a little scraping and then I put some uh, water-based wood glue outdoor permanent wood glue around that end. I let that dry until it's nice and tacky and I slip the sack over, twirl it to make certain everything's in good contact, also to make certain that the sack is relatively straight so it fits into the barrel nicely. I let that dry for a day and then I use a thin layer of, of shellac, the same type of shellac that was used uh, in the vintage pen day, to seal that connection between the sack and the section. Some people coat that uh, end of the section with shellac before they put the sack on, but I found that the shellac, if you put too much of it on, I think it degrades the sack, and at least when you try to remove the sack later, it's a real uh, challenge to scrape off everything because the sack is hardened and, and adhered to the section. Here, if you need to disassemble, replace the sack, it's a very simple thing to, to get it off eventually. But it fits nice and tight. It's not going to come off normally. So before we uh, assemble this pen, the final stage before the inking, I have a bag here of pure talc that I bought many, many years ago. And it's pure talc, not baby talc or anything else, because you want pure talc with no fragrance or any other impurities in it. And you just coat the sack nicely. So that makes it slip in easier and it also is a, it provides a little bit of a desiccant in case there's any 
moisture left in there. It inserts easily. And my tendency is to line up the lever with the nib because I like seeing that when I do filling. And then that just pushes in place. So that's the assemble. Now we're ready to ink it up and see how that nice gold nib will work. I'm not going to do anything to clean up those little marks there at the tipping end of the nib. The tines are well aligned, good contact with the feed, good flow. I think someone tried to pull it out with pliers or they may have used pliers to do something with it and those pliers left marks. I think they can be almost completely removed but right now I just want to write with it as is before I do anything else and let's see how it writes. So I realize I probably haven't shown filling a lever bladder pen. So let's show you. This is the ink I want to use in the pen. Nice safe ink but I'm not worried about using noodlers and Mass 54th was my second choice but I went in something with a little blue in it. So we're going to insert it and the ink uh, comes above the section and we're going to listen to see what we hear or see. Yes, air bubbles out. And as with any pen, I'm going to do three fills. Make certain that that ink also uses a flush of the feed and everything gets nice and saturated. There's no more bubbles except for the first bunch of bubbles that came out. So you get a, I think we're going to get a nice fill, probably a little bit less than a mil, maybe 0.7, but I don't measure. So we're going to wipe that nib off. Yes, there's a fair amount of ink on it. And touch nib to paper. Stay tuned. So after inking up the pen and doing some writing with it, the nib was about, 85% of what I expected. These are stiff nibs and under the loop I find the nib to be slightly out of alignment. One side of the end of the nib was slightly higher than the other. It was very minor but in a stiff nib like this that has a more impact on writing than a soft nib because when the tines touch the paper on a soft nib they'll automatically align to the paper. With a stiff nib it takes more pressure and you have a tendency to feel sharpness which I did in the nib. So I worked on aligning and I used my famous gauges here and this is the one that fit well. So with the nib is I worked this into the nib, went down to it, and then I pushed down the tine that was higher. I'd rather push down the one that was higher rather than pull up the one that was lower because you want to keep in contact with the feed and you don't want to do that. You know, make that not work properly. So after, after doing that and from the loop viewpoint, feeling that nib was aligned well, I then wrote with it a little bit more and certain strokes it was a little bit scratchy and catched on paper and primarily the upstroke. So using my nail board which has a coarse, a medium and a fine polishing side on it I just worked those strokes that I felt needed to have a little bit of smoothing to them. I always do some figure eights and some general strokes go from the coarser side to the medium side to the fine side. Some people only use the fine side but yeah, I'm not patient enough just to do that so I work this nib and now I think the nib is at a hundred percent. So I really like this pen. It fits well in the hand very well in the hand. It's a good size pen which is how it was described on on eBay. It's light. We'll give you the weights. And even though this Franken cap does post, it posts very high and it does change the balance just enough so it's not something I think is uh, a good writing experience, at least for my hands. So this is a pen I would definitely write with unposted. And that's a classic 
vintage section, kind of beefy with a big flare out there at the bottom. We'll give you the dimensions of the section. I mean, I think the diameter is really good. Those threads are not sharp at all. You can hold this anywhere, including up here on the barrel. We'll give you the diameter of the barrel. So I'm happy I got the pen. I can see why I got it for the price that I did because probably more people than who were much more experienced than me figured out it was a Franken pen. Probably saw those nicks on the nib and decided it wasn't worth investing any money into it. For me, what really counts is how it writes, and let's see how it does write. When I write the first writing sample, here's the microphone right next to the nib. It magnifies the sound of the nib on paper, but I think that's important and I consistently do this with my writing. So for those of you that follow my channel, you can compare the sound of the nib on paper. Hopefully get some feeling for the writing. So this is now a great nib. I really like it. It's worth to me the price of the pen for the nib and like I say I'm not worried about a few marks on it. If I get motivated and feel creative I'll try to smooth them out. But that's not important as I mentioned before. So a little bit of a stub property. So the horizontal strokes are basically on the fine side and the down strokes are on the medium side. And if you add a little bit of pressure, it really doesn't open up. I mean, these big gold nibs are known to be stiff, and this one is no exception to that rule. So I don't rate vintage pens because it's, it's extremely subjective, and this pen is an extremely unique pen, so there's not really anyone out there to compare it to. But all I can say is, is it is a wow pen. I'm extremely happy to have added this to my collection. I have a number of Schaefer balances and a number of them have been everyday writers and I've been very happy with them. Again, this is a type of nib that is very consistent. You can write for hours, not tiring. You know, it's tolerant of, of change in angle. So, for those of us that tire a little bit as we write and don't keep the nib at exactly that right angle, it'll still put down a decent line, which is really good. And that's what I like to me in an everyday carry. It's not overly wet. It, I think it's just the right amount of wetness, which is another thing I think is important in an, an everyday carry. So hopefully you liked my little exploration of an interesting pen purchased on eBay. Um... I like it. Hopefully you've enjoyed that. And a little bit of a history lesson is always nice to include when you discuss a vintage pen. So thank you for watching. Man, you have many great writing experiences. Hey, if you want to explore the world of vintage, I encourage it. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not for those that aren't willing to put a little bit of time and effort into maybe fine-tuning the pen. If you just like to grab a pen, ink it up and write with it, uh, then this may not be the pen for you. But to me, as a student of pens and someone who's collected for over 40 years, I like it. I hope all of you are safe, healthy, and happy. We've reached the end of this video. And the more I write with this pen, the more I, I really enjoy it. And that, to me, is one of the pleasures of vintage. And this is a good example of it. We're going to say bye for now. Ah, that nib on paper. What a feeling.